Welcome to Antietam National Battlefield. My name's Mike, and with me is Jill. And uh, we are going to uh, present this program. We call it the Irish Brigade Hike. Uh, I've been doing this for several years. It's uh, my favorite hike. Uh, and especially since we're doing it close to St. Patrick's Day. So that's why we're doing it in March. It's our way to honor one of the uh, brigades that were here during the Battle of Antietam. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, and follow in the steps of the Irish Brigade as they make their way toward the sunken road. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about how the immigrants from Ireland came to the United States and why these immigrants were so willing to give up their lives for their adopted country. And uh, it's quite a fascinating story to kind of understand how uh, immigrants felt it was so important that they prove to the other citizens of this great country of ours that they were worthy of citizenship and that they should be treated the same as anybody else. So one way that they could get respect was to be in the United States military. And the Civil War comes along and here we have the Irish Brigade being one of the uh, most honored and decorated brigades in the Civil War. Uh, and also we're going to look at uh, the commanding officer of the Irish Brigade. His name is Thomas Francis Maher. Thomas Francis Maher. And how he came about, uh, one of the few uh, individuals that not only has a monument here that we're gonna stop at over here by the tower, the observation tower, but also has a monument to his memory in Ireland, in Waterford, Ireland, and also has a monument to his memory in Helena, Montana. So he gets around. <laughs> so uh, Brigadier General Thomas Francis Marr, uh, the epitome of the Irish Brigade, uh, quite a character. Uh, he wasn't uh, probably the best as far as the general goes in knowledge of tactics and military uh, skill in terms of leadership, in terms of bringing in soldiers into battle. But he had the gift of motivation. He had the gift of uh, being able to speak to large crowds of people. Let's talk about General Marr. Born in 1823, died 1867. When he was 24 years old, he got involved with the Young Irish uh, movement in Ireland. Ireland had gone through the most terrible times of its existence. Uh, it did not, was not a republic. Uh, most of the farms were owned by absentee landlords. It was known for its agricultural exports, uh, for its livestock, for its uh, the crops, especially its potatoes. But in the 1830s, somehow a blight originated in Ireland. Uh, from my research, it seems like it came from the eastern United States, affected the potato crop that led to uh, almost a million Irish people dying of starvation. And from that, we see with no hope in Ireland, many decided to immigrate. And where did they go? Well, where they thought they, their labor could be more useful. Many of these were rural farmers. Did they, were they skilled laborers? Some were, most were not. And a place uh, that needed labor was the United States. So almost a million will uh, immigrate to the United States. But meanwhile, Thomas Francis Marr, he was born of privilege. He uh, was not a farmer. Uh, he went to the best schools in Ireland. Uh, his dad was a merchant. Twice he was, his dad was the mayor of Waterford. And so he and a group of these Irish, uh, young Irish uh, people uh, began this movement of expressing themselves in their speeches and so forth. Uh, at one point, uh, he went to France to converse with some of those who led the rebellion in France in the 1840s. They gave him a gift, and the gift was his flag. And this will later be, of course, the Irish Republic flag. So Thomas Francis Marr 
took this flag, he went to the second story of a building there in Waterford, Ireland, and he flew the flag. And the flag stayed there for eight days until it was taken down. And you might say that led to his arrest on charges of treason. And he was found guilty. He was sentenced to be hung, drawn, and quartered. How would you like to be hear that sentence? But since it was a kind of a draconian uh, type of sentence that had been off the books for a while, uh, Queen Victoria took pity and decided to send him to Tasmania. And when he went to Tasmania, he was duty bound to agree that he would never attempt to escape. Well, he will be there for four years and he tells his captors, his jailers there, that he's uh, considering escaping. He had to, let, in his thinking, he had to let them know that he was considering leaving because he, he was duty bound not to escape. Well, he did escape, made his way to California. Eventually, he got to New York City and became known as this Irish patriot that could speak to the multitudes there of uh, the immigrants that came to New York. And uh, he was a newspaper writer. He became a lawyer, uh, became a spokesperson, a spokesperson. Uh, at one point, uh, because he was so well known, a famous case occurred. Uh, a fellow by the name of Dan Sickles had killed his wife's lover, who was a descendant of the uh, composer of the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, he claimed temporary insanity. And on the desk, Sickles, as we know, later in the Civil War, became a Civil War general, lost his leg at Gettysburg. On the desk, the dream team, so to speak, was Thomas Francis Marr. And why was he there? Well, he didn't really speak too much, but the dream team saw that a lot of the jurors could trace their ancestry back to Ireland. And here was this fella on the table there uh, supporting the defense, the temporary insanity, the first uh, claim of innocence due to temporary insanity. And of course, Dan Sickles got off. So he got around, he got around. Now in New York City, one of the uh, ways that you could achieve some sort of, um, not only some salary, but also uh, some importance there in the city was to join the militia. And uh, an Irishman by the name of Michael Corcoran uh, became active in the militia that was there in New York City, became known as the 69th New York State Militia. Uh, Michael Corcoran, uh, very well known in the Irish community. Uh, in 1860, 61 I should say, uh, a visitor, a famous visitor, was coming to New York City. 19-year-old Prince of Wales. And so the, uh, the mayor and the councilman and so forth, they were going to have a nice parade there in New York City. So they sent out invitations to all the militia units. But Michael Corcoran says, we're not going to be there. We are, uh, we know what uh, is happening in England and because of all the injustice and so forth, uh, we will not participate. So they did not participate in that. And so he was brought up on charges. He was gonna be court-martialed. But what saved him was the Civil War. The Civil War came about and they needed soldiers and they needed lots of soldiers. In fact, as these Irish immigrants came into the major places where the ships would arrive in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, there would be recruiting stations. Uh, as the war began, they were signing up uh, men for 90 days, three months. That's your service, 90 days. And so in New York City, who was the best recruiter? Thomas Francis Marr. He was able to motivate these men to join the 69th. He became a captain of Company K, the 69th. At one point, at one point, 
he spoke to a crowd of 60,000 to get them to, to recruit for the army. <clears throat> now, I keep thinking, now, there wouldn't, you know, how do they amplify a voice that you could be heard by 60,000 people? I, I don't know. They had some way. But that's what my research said. So we have now Mar uh, marching off to war. Uh, and, of course, we have the first battle of Manassas or Bull Run. Uh, Mar will be brigaded, his 69th Corcoran, again, still in command, uh, with William Tecumseh Sherman. He was the brigade commander. And Sherman was very prejudiced against the Irish soldiers, for whatever reason. Uh, but the Irish soldiers, they are able to uh, be respectful in their duty there at the first bull run. Uh, they cover the retreat as the Union Army made its way back to Washington, D.C. But 90 days are up, and so we see uh, still the need for more soldiers. So it was Marr that got approval to have a brigade of Irish soldiers. Uh, he has to recruit again. He's known for his recruiting skills. Uh, in this brigade will be the 69th New York, the 63rd New York, and the 88th New York. Those three regiments. Uh, President Lincoln thought they should have a general that is a uh, respected commander, uh, someone that uh, would not entirely make it appear as though it's uh, just immigrants in this in this uh, brigade. So they asked a, a general by the name of James Shields if he would be the commanding officer. He agrees, uh, but he's in Texas. But he makes it back to New York City, and he finds that Marr was the one that instituted all the actions to get the brigade formed up. So he uh, says, no, I will not accept command. Uh, I would rather be a division commander. So Marr then will become a brigadier general mainly because of his influence with the Irish community. Again, not because of his uh, military skills, his knowledge of tactics and all of that. So, uh, his idea of uh, going to war or to battle is to charge your bayonets and attack in a frontal attack. Uh, that's about basically most of his knowledge. And I'll lead the way. There was no question about his courage. So we see Marr now uh, with the, in the Peninsula Campaign, the uh, brigade uh, to even it out, the 28th um, Massachusetts, or I'm sorry, 29th Massachusetts uh, was attached to uh, the Irish Brigade. Uh, so it was kind of unusual that you had these three regiments that were mainly Irish immigrants, and then you had this one regiment, the 29th Massachusetts, they were from around Boston, and they, uh, some of them, could trace their heritage back to the Mayflower. And they would say to folks, you know, that we're with these immigrants, we're really Americans. So there was this kind of, um, you might say, discrimination going on. But later, uh, it, they seemed to work that out quite a bit. So when we think of the Irish Brigade, uh, we're looking at the Second Corps. Uh, the Second Corps will be under the command of Edwin Poe Sumner. Uh, General Sumner uh, will be in charge of three divisions. Uh, as we see the Union Army retreat uh, back from the Seven Days Battles, they will arrive in uh, right outside of Alexandria. And then we have the uh, Second Battle of Manassas, another Confederate victory. And then Robert E. Lee decides at that time that he's bringing his men up into Maryland with hopes of going up into Pennsylvania. This will be known as the Maryland Campaign. The Maryland Campaign. Robert E. Lee, after the uh, Battle of Chantilly, actually, uh, August the 30th, right outside of Washington. It's Lee that will bring the Civil War to the good folks here in Sharpsburg, Maryland. How does this come about? Well, Lee says to Jefferson Davis, now is the most propitious time, he says, to bring his army up from Virginia. If he could get as far north, 20 miles to the north, Pennsylvania, and have a victory in a northern state, maybe get as far north as Harrisburg, 
He could prove to the Northern people that now's the time to negotiate. We are winning. The Confederate Army, the Confederate Army is on the move. The Army of Northern Virginia is on the move. Uh, convince England and France to recognize the Confederacy. Uh, get the war out of Virginia. Feed his troops off the untouched fields of Maryland and Pennsylvania. Uh, hoping that he would get some support from the Marylanders. If you go over to that monument right there, the Maryland State Monument, you would find that it honors those from Maryland that fought at this battle, those who served in the Confederate Army and the Union Army. Most of the Marylanders here were in the Union Army, but there were Marylanders in Confederate artillery units. So kind of hard to find monuments dedicated to both sides, but you find that here, the Battle of Antietam. So that was a, a risky proposition for the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, they uh, had soldiers that were, many of them, going back home. Uh, they were getting letters from relatives saying that if you don't come and help us get the crop in, we're going to die. Uh, some of the officers and some of the regiments looked the other way as some of the men skedaddled home to, to get some leave time or unscheduled leave to help out the family. Uh, many of the soldiers were foot sore. Uh, the misery index was pretty bad in the Army of Northern Virginia. A lot of the soldiers uh, had no shoes. They were existing on what they could find in the farm fields of Maryland and Pennsylvania. Uh, green apples and green corn seemed to be the staple of their diet. Uh, what do you, what happens when you eat a lot of green apples and green corn? What did mom say? You know, what's going to happen? You got to get a, <laughs> you got to get a stomach ache and worse. So yes, yeah, so that diarrhea, dysentery, rampant through the ranks. But Lee had this faith in his troops that they could do almost anything he orders them to do. So about 45,000 begin crossing the Potomac River right outside of Leesburg. Now they come into Frederick, Maryland on the other side of that far ridge, that is South Mountain. These plans to go over the ridge into the Cumberland Valley and then head up north. Use the mountains on his flanks to screen his movements, draw his supplies from the Shenandoah Valley to the south of us, and head up into Pennsylvania. Now that's the plan. The plan is to come into Maryland, maybe get support, but continue. He's banking on this idea that the Union Army is demoralized, that they uh, are getting new recruits into the army that have not been trained up, and which is true. Eventually, the Army of the Potomac will have almost 25% of new soldiers that have not been trained up. They're green. They've only been in the army for six weeks. It takes nine steps to load and fire a muzzle-loading weapon. And if you're good, under ideal situation, maybe you could fire three rounds per minute. That's about as fast as you could do that. You had to have a muscle memory. You had to know what to see, uh, well, what to do in terms of a battle when you heard orders. Do you move in, a, in this direction? Do you move in this direction? And so forth. Uh, every weapon at this battle, as well as Civil War battles, used black powder. Visibility, very poor, especially at, the, at this battle. So trained troops was very important. Lincoln appoints George B. McClellan to save the Republic. The, ha the, the future of the United States is in his hands. His orders are to take his army of about 86,000 and stop the Confederate invasion. Stop the Confederate invasion. To his credit, he reorganizes the Army of the Potomac and they're on the road faster than what Lee had thought they would be. Uh, Lee has a problem. He has to secure his supply lines going down to Harper's Ferry. 12,000 Union troops are down there. He sends Stonewall Jackson with almost two-thirds of the Confederate Army to converge on Harper's Ferry from three different directions, capture Harper's Ferry, and then rejoin the Confederates that will be up there on top of South Mountain. Uh, Jackson knows Harper's Ferry like the back of his hand. He heads off with most of the Army Back to Harper's Ferry. How many of you been to Harper's Ferry? Okay, if you haven't been there, you need to go. <clears throat> As they go on their mission, Lee up there on September the 13th, going into the 14th, sees columns of Union troops coming up the reverse slope up there on top of that mountain. We have the Battle of South Mountain, September the 14th. By the end of the day, 
the Confederates are overwhelmed and they have to retreat back to Virginia. The day's gone against us. That's what Lee said. His army comes down to Boonesboro, right over here. You can see the roots of the buildings over here. And they head south toward a village called Sharpsburg, Maryland. Four miles south of Sharpsburg is the Potomac River. They're going to wade across the Potomac River at the place where it's all, that's shallow enough to get all of their men, their horses, their wagons, their artillery back to Virginia, which was Virginia at that time. Meanwhile, coming up, uh, again, more and more troops under McClellan's command. Uh, on the 15th, as Lee is getting ready to wade across the river, uh, he gets news as to what happened down at Harper's Ferry, the largest surrender of soldiers fighting under the United States flag until the fall of Bataan in World War II. 12,500 Union soldiers surrendered. 73 cannons, 13,000 rifles, I mean a treasure trove of uh, military equipment. So Lee sees what we see here today, and he decides to make a stand. Jackson, get to Sharpsburg as quick as you can. Jackson will begin arriving on the 16th. He leaves one of his divisions down there to take care of the surrender under A.P. Hill. Jackson arrives. Jackson will be in charge of the Confederate left flank. So about where we're at here, extending to my left through the West Woods to the Potomac River, Jackson is in charge of that part of the Confederate line of battle. From where I'm standing, down to the farmsteads here, the sunken road down to the Antietam Creek, a mile and a half to the east of us, uh, James Longstreet will be in charge of that. Uh, McClellan will finally get his men in position the evening of the 16th. His plan called for moving soldiers coming from that direction toward the Confederate's line of battle that stretched right across the other side of that five real fence that you see closest to us. Right across the field there, over to the line. Two divisions hunkered down on the ground, taking the fence rails apart for protection. Uh, Longstreet again will find a good place, a fallback position down here in the sunken road. Where do you put artillery in the Civil War? You had to see your targets. So high ground is where the Confederates will place their artillery. Right here where we're standing will be 19 cannons and they're all pointed in that direction. By the end of the day, 500 cannons will be firing close to 65,000 shells. Artillery hell, that's what one officer described this battle. So we see now the battle comes to the good folks of Sharpsburg, Maryland. And so we're gonna, when we make our way down to the Moomaw Farm and also to the Roulette Farm, you'll uh, hear stories about some of the problems that they have to encounter. Well, the battle begins to the north of us. The epicenter of the morning of the battle will be the cornfield. Exchanges hands six times within the first three hours of the battle, close to 8,000 casualties. By seven o'clock, the Confederates counterattack. John Bell Hood's division rushes into the cornfield. Uh, his regiments from Texas, 1st, 4th, 5th Texas, Hampton's Legion, they get annihilated there in the cornfield because on the other side of the cornfield, the Union 12th Corps has arrived. Joseph Mansfield sends his men into attack. One of his uh, generals, George Green, is able to push the Confederate artillery off of this ridge. By 9 o'clock, the Confederates have been smashed. Coming into the battle will be Edwin Vos Sumner, 65-year-old general. General Sumner, there he is, a nice color, colorized photo of General Sumner, 65. I guess he would be uh, on the cover of the AARP magazine. <laughs> In the Army, all his adult life, he was not a West Point graduate. They called him Bull, Bull Sumner because when he was commanding dragoons out west, fighting the Comanches, they said a bullet bounced off his skull. He's so stubborn, they called him Bull Sumner. Sumner had 15,000 men under his command, three divisions. Uh, the lead division, John Sedgwick, then came French, and then came William French, and then Israel Richardson. Uh, his staff, it's about where you see those uh, utility poles. And you can see a couple of people there walking around the intersection. Right there. 
He looks to the north, he sees no Confederates. He looks to his front, all he sees is dead bodies. He looks to his south, he sees no Confederates. He's got one division, primed and ready. He's chomping at the bit to get in the battle. He organizes John Sedwick's division and he will lead that division. He'll be with John Sedwick. They'll line up shoulder to shoulder and go into the West Woods. Unbeknownst to them, the Confederates are getting help. Arriving from Harper's Ferry, Lafayette McClaws has arrived. Lafayette McClaws marched all night. His men dead tired. They're asleep in a clover field south of Sharpsburg. Go over to the West Woods. Well, they didn't call it the West Woods. Just go in that direction. You'll find out what, what's going to happen. Walter Taylor rushes over and he tells, he's the adjutant for the Army of Northern Virginia. So, Confederates are arriving to help out Jackson. And then Lee's a traffic director. He's moving soldiers back and forth. One of the reasons why he wanted to have this battle here is because it had good interior lines. He could move men from one place to the other. A traffic director, so to speak. So that's what he did. He moved soldiers from the lower bridge or Burnside Bridge, running through town to help out uh, Jackson. And suddenly, Sedwick gets hit from three different directions by artillery fire, rifle fire. Uh, Sumner yelled out of his voice, Bull Sumner, he said, my God, boys, we're in a terrible fix. And he extricates his men back to the starting point. So all of this is happening during the morning of the battle. Now, what about the other two divisions? The other divisions, William French and Israel Richardson. They do not go in that direction. They're going to head in that direction. And that's basically where we're going to talk about what happened with uh, those two divisions. The Irish Brigade was with Israel Richardson's division. Now, when you look at this battle, a lot of times we say there were three phases. We say the morning phase, the midday phase, and the afternoon phase. Well, basically, it's really two phases because as the uh, battle begins moving in the direction toward the sunken road. Action was picking up down at the Wower Bridge about 10 o'clock. So as the sunken road will be where the action is beginning around uh, 9.30, things were heating up down at the Lower Bridge, Burnside's Bridge. And uh, as we see the battle flow through the day, uh, we'll see the Confederate line of battle being pushed back, but they don't break down at the lower bridge. By that afternoon, the Union Army gets across the bridge and they push against the Confederates up on the high ground. Uh, the final attack will be there where the Union Army is about to overrun the Confederates up on the Harpers Ferry Road when finally for their salvation comes A.P. Hill's division to save the day. 12 hours of fighting, 23,000 casualties. Here, bloodiest one day in American history. So having said that, we're about ready to move out. What we're going to do is a facsimile of the Irish Brigade flag. Now, the flag that they carried was much, much larger than this. But you can see how different it was from the other regimental flags that the uh, Union Army had here, as well as other throughout the Civil War. Ireland's flag, you know, the original Irish flag actually dated back to 1642 and it was green background with a harp. Uh, Ireland is the only country basically that has as its symbol a musical instrument. Can't get any better than that, right? But on this flag, you can see symbols. We can see the shamrocks, the harp, the cloudburst. We will not retreat from the clash of spears. The flags become very distinctive. Everyone knew the Irish Brigade and its flag. In 1963, the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, went to Ireland to visit his ancestral home. He brought with him one of the Irish Brigade Brigade's flags that had been uh, made at Tiffany's there in New York City, presented it to the parliament there in Ireland. When I was reading about 
the Irish Brigade Monument that we'll visit, uh, a bill had to go through Congress to actually get that monument built. And it was, uh, the opening ceremony was in 1997. And one of the reasons why that bill went through Congress was because of a certain senator from Massachusetts. And you can guess who that was. Edward Kennedy. We'll talk more about the Irish Man on when we get that program. Uh, Edward Kennedy was here. Uh, in fact, we have a video of uh, John Kennedy arriving here in 1963. His helicopter landed right here. Not on the monument, but over here. And in the background, you could see there was no West Woods at that time. That was all clear cut. There were trailers right across the road there. But with him that day was Edward Kennedy. And then uh, Senator Kennedy came here in 1993, uh, and John F. Kennedy Jr. was with him that day. And he told our park ranger, Keith Snyder, that uh, he was here before with his brother. He said he was here with his brother. So uh, they were very influential in, in the monument here, and of course the Irish Brigade and the reputation that it had. Now, flags are very important. Color bearers, brave soldiers that were brave enough to carry the colors into battle. Because if you're attacking the enemy, you're looking for the colors. You're looking for the flags. Just as we love our parades, right? Who leads the parade? The color guard, right? Well, these regiments, one of the things that the soldiers were trained to do was to follow the the flags, the colors. And if that flag was captured by the enemy, that was quite a disgrace. And also, if you captured their flag, that was quite an honor. If you look at the photo of President, Link, or President Lincoln here talking with uh, George McClellan, on the table, or underneath the table, I should say, is a Confederate regimental flag. Uh, some would say it was captured down here at the Sunken Road but it was on display for the president to look at one of their flags. So what I'm going to ask is that we have a volunteer here to lead the way for a short amount of time unless you get shot and then you have to give it to somebody else. But who will step forward and lead us in our march here today? Do we have anyone that's willing to do that? All righty. We're going to lead the way here is the U.S. flag. And different designs there on the flag that was uh, somewhat popular there in 1862 with the stars there. If you look over here, you see that monument? What's draped on the top of that obelisk monument? Uh, the United States flag. The 20th New York were not Irish. Most of them were German. They were German immigrants. And that's why you see symbols on that obelisk monument of their German heritage. If you go to the National Cemetery, they have another monument. And it has actually German writing on the monument. The 20th New York has that in the National Cemetery. And also in the National Cemetery, you'll see the graves of Irish soldiers that were found here in 1987. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, on our program. Thank you.